General Kelly will now present awards, letters, and certificates. Madam Morris, please come forward. Please rise for the reading of a citation to accompany the Defense Meritorious Service Medal. <coughs> Citation to accompany the award of the Defense Meritorious Service Medal to Commander Linda M. Morris. Commander Linda M. Morris, United States Navy, distinguished herself by exceptionally meritorious service as Chief, Managed Care Division, Department of Defense, Health Service Region 5, from May 1998 to April 2000. During this period, the outstanding managed care skills, professional leadership, and ceaseless efforts of Commander Morris substantially contributed to the implementation of a managed care support contract. Her tenacious pursuit of beneficiary service spearheaded her division's successful implementation of numerous initiatives which reached beyond Region 5 to significantly improve TRICARE on a national level. Commander Morris's support was an integral factor in establishing Region 5 as a center of excellence for the TRICARE Prime Remote Program, which made great strides toward providing a uniform benefit to members stationed in remote areas and isolated from military medical treatment facilities. The distinctive accomplishments of Commander Morris culminate a distinguished career in the service of her country and reflect great credit upon herself, the United States, and the Department of Defense. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. General Kelly will now present a letter from the Commander-in-Chief. Certificate of Appreciation for Service in the Armed Forces of the United States. I extend to you my personal thanks and a sincere appreciation of our nation for your honorable service. You helped to maintain the security of the United States of America with the devotion to duty that is in keeping with the proud tradition of our armed forces. I honor your service and respect the commitment and loyalty you displayed over the years. My best wishes to you for happiness and success in the future. Bill Clinton, Commander-in-Chief. General Kelly will now present Commander Boris's parents, Leonard and Lorraine Boris, with a certificate of appreciation for their unwavering support for their daughter during her 24 years of naval service. Captain DeGuyder, please escort Mr. and Mrs. Morris to center stage. <laughs> Certificate of Appreciation from the United States Navy to all who shall see these greetings, as you were, to all who shall see these presents, greetings. To Mr. and Mrs. Boris, today after completing over 20 years of active naval service, your daughter has added an honorable and faithful service to her country, and her efforts are sincerely appreciated. Such a rich and rewarding career reflects a strong commitment to the principles of freedom and democracy, and the belief that they must be upheld at any cost. That type of total commitment is not possible without the full support of the entire family. Although you may have never had to carry out a military order or deploy in the hostile waters, your loyalty and steadfast support of your daughter's career can rightly be viewed as service to your country. That loyalty and dedication were significant sources of strength for your daughter during arduous duty and exemplified the highest tradition of patriotism. On behalf of the Department of the Navy and the staff of DOD Health Service Region 5, I extend to you a sincere thanks 
and express our appreciation. Good job, well done. Given this 10th day of March, 2000, Joseph E. Kelly, Brigadier General, United States Air Force, Medical Corps, Lead Agent, DOD Health Service Region 5. <laughs> recognition of the support she has provided her daughter during her distinguished service in the United States Navy. Ladies and gentlemen, 
It gives me great pleasure to introduce Commander Linda Boris, Medical Service Board, <laughs> United States Navy. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. I wrote down what I wanted to say just because I don't want to forget anything. I know my theater friends will say I should memorize my lines, but um, they didn't. Uh, General Kelly, uh, Colonel Tonight, Pat Snyder, Dan, uh, family and friends, uh, thank you for all being here. This is really terrific. Um, when I was thinking about what this is going to be like, I thought, you know, when you're a little girl, and most little girl, women girl relate to this, you always dream of that day when, of your wedding and big reception afterwards. And I never did have one of those, but I'm thinking that this is better. Because first of all, I can do it all by myself, which... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the only thing that seems to be missing is the vocal music, but maybe we can uh, have, that, have that later on. Um, I really appreciate the, the number of different families that I have here in this room today. And, of course, my biological family, my mother, father, my aunt Pat, and Uncle Bob, and my, my doggy cousin, Benji, who's out the band, um, <laughs> who is very well groomed for this. I really wanted to have him in the ceremony, but I didn't think he would love with with, uh, with Um My surrogate family uh, here in Ohio, since I've been here, my Beaver Creek Community Theater family over there, and uh, they have really been like a family to me since I've been here and have taken me in. And, um, trying not to let me leave, but I'm trying to take them with me, so. Uh, um, some of my good friends from out of the area, uh, that's Dave, um, Sandy, it's Sandy, uh, got you in the background, back there, and of course, uh, Dan, who wins the prize for coming the farthest from Washington State. Um, um, and all of the people, especially, who has really been a great honor and a pleasure to uh, to work with the last 22 months, and actually has been that long, and they've been um, at the lead agent's office. You're my comrades in arms, and it has been such a fun experience in the office because of everybody who's in this room from the office uh, here. It really has been fun. Uh, I want to thank Lieutenant Seaworth and the committee for putting together this really terrific ceremony um, and this luncheon, and for making sure that I have a real Navy retirement here. I'm really worried about that coming to Air Force Country that I wasn't going to be able to have a Navy <laughs> retirement, but she managed to do it. Um, and I, so I especially want to thank the sea cadets. You guys did a great job uh, with the color guard and um, and Chief Sammons for being here with the uh, the bosun's whistle. It, it's hard in uh, Dayton, Ohio, to find uh, find some of that Navy talent. Um, all of you have really made this day such a such a special event. Uh, but I especially wanted to thank uh, especially my good friend Dan uh, Snyder, my who's been a great mentor to me and um, for being here. And he, has, he and I have known each other since my first got commissioned in 1983. And my first duty station was at the Naval Medical Clinic in Annapolis. Um, and I really don't know, seriously, if I would have made it as an officer, made that transition from enlisted to officer, if it had been for Dan. Because Dan had done it, and he was sort of a buffer between me and, uh, and the XO at the time. You probably remember we had kind of a tough time. Um, and I'll never forget that talk I got in the XO's office one day where he said to me, Lieutenant Boris, you better get on the party line. And I thought I had gone to Russia. I was so scared. Um, but Dan kind of helped me understand, you know, that being an officer was very different than being enlisted and really helped get through it. And I just wanted to tell a little story that, um, that really did my how Dan has been for me my entire career. Uh, when we were in Annapolis, uh, Dan used to skip her a, uh, the customs complicated boat that he used to keep over at the Naval Station. And if you put so many hours of work into it, you could, you could take it out. And Dan was skipper in this boat. Uh, was uh, the Geronimo. And it was a beautiful 44-foot new quarter. And a bunch of us used to go out on it, jump the Chesapeake, and, and go sailing. Well, one day we were going to pull up uh, alongside, for some reason I don't remember, to the academy. We were going to get off on the academy grounds, and it required pulling the boat up along the seawall. Well, Dan turned to me, and he said something to the effect of, Linda, why don't you go ahead and take it in? Now, I have trouble parallel parking my little Subaru, and he's asking me to parallel park this 44-foot sailboat. This thing is huge against the seawall. <coughs> well, Dan, in his usual style, told me, it's okay, you can do it coached me through the entire thing, talked me through the entire thing, and made me feel like I was doing it. Uh, but despite the fact that if he had not told me every single thing to turn the wheel, okay, turn my car, do this, do this, do this, I would never have been able to do it. And then congratulated me when I was done, told me what a great job I did. When I know that I really did do it, that he really did it. But he's always been that way. He's always made, I'm sure he does this with everybody, makes them feel like um, very proud and very able to do uh, something that seems impossible. And I think that's, uh, that's obviously why I'm, I'm asking here today, and I think that's probably why he accepted that part, um, that part of him. 
Um, there's always a lot of pressure when you get up there and say something really profound, and, and this is my day, so I didn't want to work that hard to come up with something. So, <laughs> um, so in keeping with the multimedia, um, uh, I'm not going to do my... See, no, I'm not gonna, uh, 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 um, I have brought with me some of the... I, I'm a pack rat, and I have one, which is why I'm single in the three-bedroom house, but um, <laughs> I, I, I brought, and I brought with me some of the souvenirs that I have collected over my military career, because I do sit down and I look at these things from time to time, and I remember, oh, remember when I did this, and, got to, and I really makes me aware of some of the really neat things I got to do while I was in the military. Some of the things that were fun, some things that were challenging, some things that were difficult, but they've all been really great. So I wanted to share some of those things with you. And it's just here. My parents had saved the letters that I wrote when I was in Army boot camp. And, uh, and they gave them to me a while back. And I just wanted to read this one, this one part. Let me know if you can't hear me at any time. Um, this one letter, November 29, 1974. You know, you said that everybody gets hysterical when you tell them the things I have to do, like ironing beds. We thought I had to iron the top on our bed uh, in boot camp. Well, there are a lot of dumb things we have to do, but we don't even think of them as dumb things anymore. We just do them. I've been doing that for a while now. <laughs> when, I was, uh, when I was in processing, I couldn't help but ask myself again and again, what am I doing here? Now I don't do it anymore. I haven't found the answer to it yet, but I've just stopped asking myself the question, which is maybe I've stopped asking the question. It doesn't matter why I'm here. I just am. It's my life now, and, and the bay is my home away from home. So that, I, I had noticed through the letters that, I, that this this um, kind of evolution of my sense of why I was a purpose and why I was there. And when, when I read that, it's very profound. I'm 19 years old, you know. Think about how profound that was for that. Um, I did have a packet. I had been open up MRE from the Army. Well, Dave Darrell. Well, uh, <laughs> I remember writing back home and asking my father, do you know what an azimuth is? What do I need to do with that? Um, I had saved a whole package of material from... Uh, when the uh, South Vietnamese orphans were airlifted out after the fall of Saigon, um, <coughs> of course, it made a lot of the media, a lot of the press, and I had the good fortune of being stationed at the Presidio of San Francisco at the time. And they called upon some of the uh, medics in the, uh, at the time to come in and help with the babies and with the children. Uh, they put mattresses out in this huge gymnasium uh, called Harmon Hall on the Presidio. And I would go and volunteer, and sometimes at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'd be walking up and down, pacing the floor with these kids whose you know, clocks were saying it was a different time. Um, and this is a this is a picture um, of the hall where I worked, and I'm not actually in this picture, but this is from Time or Newsweek um, of all the little children on the on the mattresses uh, at Harmon Hall, little Vietnamese orphans uh, uh, during the orphan airlift. I got to do a lot with that. I got to take the kids to the airport to meet up with their adoptive parents, and uh, uh, just got to do a lot of really neat. Uh, it was a really special uh, special thing to be involved in. This was is my California state. Psychiatric technician license. You didn't, you didn't have to. When you were psych tech. You didn't have to get licensed in the state where you were, but a lot of us did it. You know, just to, to have it in a picture from one or two moonlight or something. Um, and it was a bad. You know, it was like passing your uh, board for ACT. You know, you have to take a very difficult exam, and so it was kind of a badge of courage to, uh, to do that. So that was my my license. This is a program for my graduation ceremony at core school. I was a valedictorian. That was a lot of fun. This is my earthquake survival handbook. I spent three, I spent a total of about six years in the San Francisco Bay Area. You have to have this book because, you know, you did how to survive an earthquake. Um, but, and I love the San Francisco area, but I would never go live there because earthquakes are very, very scary. Um, but I did learn that don't, that don't panic, which is always the first thing in the air an earthquake survival thing. It really has stood me a good stead throughout my life because I remember that in certain situations I've been in, and first don't panic. <laughs> this is a little brochure from the Officers Club at Newport, uh, where I went to officer indoctrination school after I got commissioned. I um, when I was up, at, up in Annapolis after I first got commissioned, um, the uh, Beirut bombing uh, happened. And this was an article, or actually a list, that I cut out of the Washington Post, 28th of October 1983, and it's a Beirut casualty list, and I had highlighted an underlying old foreman that had been killed in the Beirut bombing. This is a uh, this is a flight suit patch. Sorry, of course, folks probably recognize. Do you guys have these? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is from 1827 in Corpus Christi, um, and uh, one of the guys gave me this patch patch on his uniform. Didn't do anything to get it. Really didn't. <laughs> 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 this is 
kind of neat. I was stationed up in uh, Beeville in, uh, at the branch clinic up there in Texas uh, and during Hurricane Gilbert. Anybody remember Hurricane Gilbert was probably one of the largest hurricanes ever to hit this side of the country. Uh, I don't know about ever. It was category five. Was it? it was over the category five. It was in category six when they had one. Um, this, the meteorologist up there gave me this, this uh, meteorological map that you can see. Um, here's, the, here's, the, here's Texas right here. The, the coastline of Texas. This little area right here. So you get you an idea of how large this thing was. Fortunately, because it was so big, it made its own atmosphere. It did not go up the coast. It went straight into northern Mexico, uh, where it was a relatively unpopulated area. And we, were, we were scared from this area. And we had to we had the clinic all boarded up, and we got to go through the drill. We, we got to go through the um, disaster uh, disaster drill, and didn't, didn't have to have bad luck. This is a little soap from the queue. It's in the point. I had to go out to the Philippines for an investi on an investigation. And, it still, still smells really nice. So, <laughs> I mean, it did it. I mean, it's probably almost 10 years old. And <laughs> this is my luggage bag from, from Manila. Um, that was in the Manila the airport. It was, that was an incredible experience. So, you know, he has luggage in all the cardboard boxes. This, I have not opened this. I'm hoping someday it could be worth something. This is an unopened package of Desert Storm trading cards. Um, <laughs> I don't know if someday they'll be, they'll be worth something. And this is a t-shirt. It didn't go, but I was taking a few men at the time and I got to do a lot of work uh, with that. This is kind of neat. This is a, not a patch, but this is a sticker that was given. It says 103 Rescue. Uh, when I was stationed at Camp Lejeune, I went with a couple of friends. used to go to the um, air station at New River, to the officers club at FDR. And one day, I was there with a bunch of friends from the hospital, and there were a couple of guys there from the Canadian uh, Defense Force. And they don't have to do a in the service, they just have a Defense Force. And these guys did rescue, they're especially the search and rescue. And we taught this one guy, me and another girl, the nurse from the hospital, taught this one guy how to do the electric slide. He'd never heard of it, never seen it. So we got up there, and the uncle was similar to this. Nobody in the club was really early. We taught him to do the electric slide, so he gave us a one of this one of this <laughs> I don't know if we want to have the better end of that day. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can still do it. This is a uh, this is called the Comfort Free Press. When I was uh, on the comfort and went to Haiti, the radio operator for the military seal command, he would he put this together uh, on like a weekly basis and he would cut out articles. Somehow he'd get a hold of newspapers, God only knows how because we could get them. Uh, but he put Dear Abby and cartoons in there, and then some of the uh, news and some of the message traffic and all in there. And he would distribute this. It was sort of an underground newspaper, is what it was. So it wasn't distributed widely, and you could kind of had to, you would get kind of dog eared people pass it around, like, you know, like it's a little boy in the Playboy magazine or something. Um, this little cartoon on the front, you see the hospital ship going over the ball, it says, Navigator, lay to the bridge on the double. <laughs> And this was the notebook that I carried around with me. I, it was only a six week, but it felt like a six month tour. Um, and I carried it in my back pocket and my khakis and everything that went on that I had to remember during the cruise. Um, I wrote in here, um, I have things like the, the patients that we got, uh, some of the Haitian uh, uh, citizens that we got. Uh, there was a reporter who got shot in the head. Fortunately, we had, you know, the Navy only has a few neurosurgeons. We had two of them on board. And it's fortunate for this guy that we did because they were able to save his life. But, um, so I have a little information like that that I can look back on and remember um, some really good things that we did, even though we didn't have to obey AP, which was great. Um, this was my favorite congressional inquiry, and I saved this because <laughs> <laughs> now you're gonna, you guys are going to like this. Anybody that's ever worked congressional is going to love this, because we all probably had one just like this. I was at UMed, and I was working congressional. And this is the, um, this is what was, they were, this is what the, uh, actually this was the staffer that wrote this, and Bob is the congressman. Once Bob could do something about the fact that Naval Hospital has a seagull rather than an eagle at the top of its flagpole. Veterans do not appreciate this. The seagull is not the American symbol. Said he wants to have the uh, which is the handle this because he is a Democrat and Jewish. So, <laughs> so, so I sent this to my counterpart at Naval Hospital San, uh, San Diego. And, uh, and I wrote, Ron. Believe it or not, we actually got a congressional inquiry asking why there was a seagull, why said eagle, on top of the flagpole at Naval Medical Center San Diego. We took the task for back to Meadow 3 as, quote, not under our area of expertise, but just out of sheer curiosity, exactly what is on the top of San Diego's flagpole. And uh, Ron wrote back, emailed back. Linda, after I finally stopped laughing, I checked into it. Admiral Nelson, who is now our Surgeon General, he was the commander at the time of San Diego. Admiral Nelson had already received probably the same inquiry and has submitted a written response to be met. He is an avid bird watcher, as you may have heard. 
got out the telescope and personally viewed the alleged seagull. <laughs> it is indeed an eagle, although somewhat stylized, gold colored, and in full flight. It could possibly be mistaken for a seagull from ground level due to the shape of the wings and the height of the mast. Official evaluation eagle. <laughs> That's how we spent our days at UMAD page 120. <laughs> This was a match book with the Metro 29 Dyer Day. I think it's where we used to go lunch. I don't remember. It's a great place to go to lunch and get away from get away from Washington. Uh, and this is a Metro. You'll recognize old Metro ticket. Uh, I'm almost at the end, don't I? Uh, oh, this now this is a bad. This is a one of the sadder times. This I could not get a paper the next day because everyone had bought up all the papers. So this is like the following day, New York Times after Admiral Ward on the Chief of Naval Operations had committed suicide. And one of the folks that worked for me, uh, she had duty that day, and I thought, talked about having a bad duty. Uh, she she told me about it, and I just we all just couldn't you know couldn't believe it, and you know we were hearing about it, so it was going on, and watching it on the news, and they were running to the uh, to the uh, navy yard, and trying to trying to make heads or tails out of that. I'm just sure anybody ever did. And the last thing that I have is is really has become great, um, really a treasure to me this year because as you know, um, Zachary Fisher, who's the uh, great philanthropist, who's responsible for the Fisher houses, Fisher Nightingale houses, which for those of you who don't know, they're the equivalent of Ronald McDonald houses. And he has to build on military bases where there are large medical centers for families to stay who have critically ill patients in the, uh, in the hospital there. And I was, uh, this is one of the assignments Dan gave me, ACHE uh, saying it's to write of uh, Zachary Fisher for, as honorary, to, for, uh, to be nominated as an honorary fellow in ACHE, American College of Healthcare Executive. Now, like I always do when I'm given something I don't want to do, I grumbled when he gave me to do it. Uh, but I am so glad that you, you know, and I, and I write to the person all the time on the internet, it was real pain, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but you great, it's great, but, um, but I, I am, was so delighted to be able to do it because, um, I got to uh, meet him at the ceremony, and he, he was relatively frail at that time, he was in a wheelchair, um, and he autographed my program, he wrote, Linda, what an exciting day for me, and he told me with great sincerity that this was the most exciting thing that's ever happened to him, this man has been decorated by the president. And he said, you know, with great sincerity, this was so exciting for him to receive this uh, this award. And then he wrote me, um, he wrote me, or he signed a little personal note to me later on. And I've always uh, saved that, and they've become real special this year uh, when he unfortunately passed away. Uh, uh, so that's been uh, that's kind of my career, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, collage of my career in a box. Um, get it all back. In. Keep it in order anyway. Um, in closing, I want to thank uh, uh, General Kelly and, and Colonel Tenai for being such great people to work with. General Kelly, I have to say this now because I'm almost out of it. He's like the coolest flight officer I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> he's, just, he's just so cool. And I know that sounds like a 19 year old, but he's just, he's so smart and yet he's such a people. <coughs> we often don't see that as you get more, you know, more senior. You usually see one or the other becoming very, very smart. Uh, or a great people person, but not too smart, but Joe Colley is, is both. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, you know, it's true. Um, I don't say that because uh, I really have been in awe of both of you, uh, and I have tried to learn so much and absorb as much as I possibly could uh, from uh, even Colonel tonight, even though it's a left-handed doctor from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Which for some reason he used as an analogy for, for stupidity, but I never thought I was it. Uh, and you have basically given me things that have will be of use to me in my uh, most of my life. And lastly, of course, I want to thank my parents, um, who I am really happy we're able to be here today because this day is as much about them as about me and my career. Uh, whenever my friends used to talk about their parents, you know, they'd always say things like, "Oh, you know, my parents are loving me to come. Um, they're always oh, they're interfering with my life," or you know, this, they're always telling these bad stories about their parents, and I just sit there and go, "Too bad," you know, because my parents have never been, and they've never given me a negative story I've ever read to tell anybody. I, they have to been the greatest parents, and, and I always think maybe it's because they were so young when they uh, when they married and started having kids. It's been like growing up with an older sister and brother, um, who who were great teachers and great mentors, but without being that sort of you know clingy, interfering kind of thing. Sometimes parents can be with their kids. Um, so in everything that I've done, I have always tried to use them as a compass, and I've constantly tried to assess whether they'd be proud of me uh, and the things that I was doing. Um, I always felt that when I finished my Navy career, the assessment of whether or not I'd been a success uh, would not be based on where I'd been or what I'd accomplished, but if I'd made them proud of me. And uh, so I hope that I have done that. And I thank you all very much for being here.
Thank <laughs> you.